My name is Sarah Ayling. I'm the Deputy Head of the Defence and Security Organisation here at the British High Commission in New Delhi. Um, and I'll be introducing our panellists and our speakers today. So no event on technology is really possible without a mention of cyber security today. And so it's great to see so many of you here listening to the session and to have so many great panellists here today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Matthew Gould. Matthew is currently the Director General for Digital and Media Policy in the Department for Digital Media, Culture and Sport back in the UK. In his previous role as British Ambassador to Israel, Matthew set up the UK Israel Tech Hub, which laid the foundations for the UK and Israel's powerful tech relationship. He was also the government's director of cybersecurity at the Cabinet Office, uh, keeping us, keeping Britain safe from cyber attack. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matthew. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? You can? That's excellent, because despite being responsible for technology for the British government, I don't trust it. Um, I particularly don't trust this technology. And whenever I have to give a speech this style, I don't really believe that it's coming through to you, so I end up shouting louder and louder in the hope you'll hear me. But I'm guessing you can hear me, so we'll, we'll carry on. What I really wanted to say, just to kick off this discussion, is the more time I spend looking at cybersecurity, the more time, the more I believe that essentially, at its heart, is a pernicious problem of asymmetry. That there is asymmetry between people who are trying to attack networks and the people whose job it is to defend them. And that um, it is cheaper and easier and frankly more fun to be trying to attack a network than it is to keep it safe. And this asymmetry, the gap between ease of attack and ease of defense is getting worse, not easier. So for example, one of the things that's happened in recent years, which I believe is of profound importance, is the commodification of attack technology. So it used to be if you wanted to mount a sophisticated attack, you would have to develop all the capabilities in-house. You'd have to have somebody to design the attack vector and somebody to design the payload and somebody to design the command and control and it would be quite a difficult thing to have all of that in a single team. Now I can sit in my bedroom and I can buy every individual element of that attack online. Can you still hear me? That's excellent. Um, so the truth is the last few years has seen uh, the commodification of attack technology in a way which in an unhelpful way has democratized the ability to mount attacks. And at the same time, we're seeing a continuing asymmetry in terms of bringing perpetrators of cybercrime to justice. So certainly in the UK, if you are a, uh, a hacker, a cyber criminal, then your chances of ending up in front of a court, your chances of being sent to prison for it are incredibly low. And this creates an asymmetry as well. So really what I wanted to do was just today kick off the discussion by talking about five responses to asymmetry that I believe should underpin what we do as people who care about cybersecurity. Response number one is innovate. We need to make sure that the people on the defense side, the people on the cybersecurity side, are thinking creatively and uh, vigorously about how we can make sure that the best new technology is on our side, not the attack side, which in the UK we have translated into making it a national security objective to have a vibrant cyber ecosystem, having uh, a flow, a pipeline of cyber SMEs, having big cyber companies, and having a really vigorous ecosystem where there is a pipeline from great ideas through to small companies, through to big companies. We've set up um, in government funded innovation centers. We work very closely with uh, fantastic private sector accelerators in cybersecurity like Cylon. And we try very hard to make sure that we have in the UK 
all the ingredients for a really vigorous cybersecurity ecosystem. And we have got uh, a number of really world-class uh, companies. So, for example, uh, British Aerospace and its cybersecurity division, British Telecom and what it does, all the way down to s sort of uh, scale-up and growth stage companies like Darktrace, like Glasswall. We have uh, a range of companies now in the UK that I believe really have something to offer in terms of exploiting the very best technology in the pursuit of cyber defense. Second thing we're doing, the second response, is to make sure that that very finite pool of people who are talented at cybersecurity, particularly that very small pool of people who have extreme talent, end up working for us and not the other side. And that means finding them when they're young and identifying their talent and bringing them into programs, which mean they end up working for companies like yours or for governments like mine, rather than as criminals and hackers trying to do damage. And so one of the things I did uh, when I was cybersecurity coordinator for the UK was we set up a program which we now call Cyber Discovery, which is a, an online way of young people going online, testing through games, their ability to, their their, 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 the, the degree to which they've got the, the what it takes to be brilliant at cybersecurity. We expected something under 10,000 people to, to apply for it in its first year. We found 30,000. So the response has been overwhelming. We found in our first year, the trial year, 100 young people who we put right at the most elite point of cybersecurity talent. So these are young people we are now going to nurture and cherish and push through into careers in cybersecurity rather than careers in crime. And I think that's a really positive development. Third thing that we need to do to tackle the asymmetry is make sure that we build into the systems we sell, the, the products, the devices, whatever they are, good cybersecurity principles and systems. So one of the things I think collectively we have done wrong in recent years has been to put a burden on individual customers or even individual companies to do the right thing. And one of the things we've learnt to our cost is that people don't actually want to do lots of stuff that makes their life a bit more complicated to make themselves cyber secure. So even though they actually know what the risk is, even though every day they read in the newspapers about different breaches and different hacks, people nonetheless don't behave in a way that, uh, that suggests they've really taken that on board. And we can carry on putting the burden on individual people and customers and companies, or we can take a different approach and say, actually, we're going to make it easy for them by building in security from the start. So, for example, one of the things my government's done in recent months has been to put out a set of principles of security, good security, for IoT devices. So that when you get when you buy something, connected fridge or whatever, a c connected light bulb, but anything that's going to connect uh, uh, connect with the internet, it comes with a number of key security features already enabled, and it doesn't rely on individual customers to do a whole load of things to reset default passwords and turn on security settings and do all the things which we know they're not going to do. And this philosophy of secure by design is increasingly going to underpin the UK approach because I think it's, it goes with the grain of human nature rather than against it. The fourth thing that we need to do in the face of asymmetry is get our own acts together. So we, we have uh, a tendency, particularly in government, to create a proliferation of different organizations all doing the same thing in an overlapping way. We've tried to address that in the UK. When I became the UK uh, cybersecurity coordinator, our then prime minister's only instruction to me was to take the, all the, the range of different institutions, all advising companies on cybersecurity, the alphabet soup of different institutions, and turn them into a single institution. And that institution is now the National Cybersecurity Center. And if you're in the UK, if you're a company, 
British or Indian or any other working in the UK or with the UK, there is now one address and one place to go to, and that's the National Cyber Security Centre. They are our national technical authority, and they are the place to go to for cyber security advice. And we've done something else as well in terms of aggregating the good guys on our side, which is we've introduced a programme which we call Active Cyber Defence. And this is uh, a way of making sure that all the things we know collectively get pulled together to try and create the best possible defenses against the bad guys. So for example, one of our aspirations, which we haven't yet ma uh, uh, fully, f f uh, fully done, but we're getting there, is individual uh, internet providers will have a list of known bad, known bad addresses that they don't want their customers to go to because they will infect their customers with malware if they do. And so individual ISPs will have a, a list of, uh, of sites that they block. Now, our proposal, which we're talking to our, our industry about, is we can do that on a national basis. We can pool all the known bad addresses that we know about, including those that the government know about, and create a shield for everyone in the country which is uh, more powerful by a considerable margin than the shield that any individual provider would be able to, to, to provide. So there is, a, there is a benefit from joining together in a smart way, which I think will start to give us the advantage over the, the bad guys in a really sort of important way. And then the last thing, and this with this I will shut up, the last thing that we can do is make sure that globally the good guys work together as well. So uh, it's one of the reasons I'm so pleased this festival is happening, I'm so pleased this panel is happening, is the UK and India need to be working together. We need to be sharing technology. We need our companies to be working together so that the benefits of innovation in both economies are felt more widely. So British companies have a benefit of Indian innovation and cybersecurity, and Indian companies have a benefit of British innovation. We want our policy makers to be comparing notes on what best practice looks like. We want our, the people responsible for national defense to be comparing information about what the bad guys are up to. If we all deal with the bad guys individually, if there is no collective effort, then we give them the advantage over us. If by contrast, there is a collective effort, we pool what we know, we make our effort a joint one and the sum more than the parts, then I think we may be on the road to undermining the asymmetry which makes cybersecurity so very difficult. So that for me is the fundamental takeaway of this discussion. And the main reason I'm here is because we need to work together. It's not a luxury, it's not an optional extra, it's an absolutely core ingredient if we're going to make ourselves cyber secure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those words, Matthew. I'd now like to welcome on stage all of our panelists. Please take your seats. For those of you that are standing, you can now come and steal the panelists' seats if you wish. <laughs> so I want to introduce uh, our excellent panel today, Dr. Sanjay Bhal. Director General for the Com Computer Emergency Response Team in India, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Davis, Army Advisor, Cyber and Communications in the Department for International Trade, Colonel Anand from the India Future Foundation, Rama Vidashri, the CEO of Data Security Council India, and James Dipple Johnston, the UK Deputy Information Commissioner. And from UK industry, I'd like to welcome Simon Hosking, Vice President, International Security Programs for BAE Systems, Robert Daniels, Security Portfolio Strategy and Propositions from BT, and Anka Prajapati, Senior Cyber Technology Specialist for Darktrace. I'd also like to welcome our moderator, Kanish Gagore, cy Cyber Security Consulting Professional and British Chevening Commonwealth Fellow, as well as our narrator, Manu Gohl, 
an urban planner with a background in architecture. Manu currently heads the Delhi-based design and planning consultancy firm, the Novarch, and is also a British Chevening Scholar. So before I hand over and we begin with the session today, I just wanted to briefly thank the India Future Foundation for its help in organizing this event. The India Future Foundation is a think tank established by some of our Chevening fellows here in India, and I'm pleased that many of them are joining us here today. Chosen for their outstanding leadership skills, it's no surprise that many of them are now in positions of influence in India. And I'm really proud that the British High Commission has managed to keep those warm relations and close relationships with all of you. So I now welcome Colonel Anand to deliver some short remarks on the foundation. Thank you, Sarah. I think Matthew has set the perspective for this talk today. Prior to that, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the British High Commission, especially Sarah and her team, for giving us this opportunity to help her out in this event. Uh, 15 years back, when I entered the field, it was not cyber security. It used to be information security. And a lot of water has flown under the bridge after that. And today, as Matthew pointed out, there is asymmetry, right? And to address this asymmetry, I think a lot of young people need to come forward to ensure that people, the countries, and the environments that they stay in remain secure. I'm glad to be associated with India Future Foundation, which is a brainchild of a few evening scholars who decide. Sorry, I, I, I thought the sound was cut off from the others. Okay. So, glad to be associated with them, started by a few Shivening scholars with the noble aim of spreading cyber awareness across the country, especially targeted towards students in the women's sector. Then, to get into the policy adequacy and policy execution and interact with global organizations of similar nature and ensure that we have a semblance of the activities that we do in the cyberspace. We would be uh, interacting with a lot of UK and EU institutions as a startup so that we can get to know what activities they are doing in the same space and try and use those in our perspective. The foundation has almost about 10 to 12 advisors, uh, subject matter experts, ranging from lawyers, from policy makers, civil servants, and cybersecurity specialists. Uh, I'm happy to be part of that, and without much ado, I think I would hand over now to the moderators to have a very exciting war game scenario being presented to you and what the industry or the environment sees today. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I am Manu Goel, I will be the narrator for the session today. So we have these uh, scenarios which I will play out and then there will be a, it will be intermittently uh, followed by discussions between the panel on those topics, moderated by Kanish. So the scenario goes like this, timing is start of a long holiday season in the nation of Kunami. It's a Monday, 7-11 hours. Social media pages of major travel websites and banks are inundated with users sharing their transaction numbers and commenting that transactions on these companies' websites through debit cards, credit cards, net banking, e-wallets are invalid, although money has been deducted from their accounts. 9.30 hours. As consumers bombard Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with negative posts and hashtags like cheat, hashtag fraud, hashtag scam, the companies' reputations nosedive, and so do their stocks on the capital markets. 10.06 hours. Initial analysis done by MyPos, Konami's biggest travel company, identify that the majority of complaints related to transactions were within a five-hour window of one o'clock and six o'clock in the morning, amounting to several thousand dollars for a flash sale on its website. 11.02 hours. Meanwhile,
11:02 hours meanwhile my forces chief information security officer discovers cues of cross site scripting attack and man in the middle attack on its website based on digital forensic evidence and identified patterns they suspect a honeypot attack between 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock hours were used to attract customers and redirect them to fake mypos affiliated banking portals worried about the impact and complexity of cyber attacks mypos ciso contacts kunami's national cyber security agency ncca to seek their help Good afternoon, everyone. So we have our first moderator in intervention here, and uh, I'll take guidance from uh, the respected panelists in terms of how they see this incident should be handled. So my first question is uh, to the members of uh, Indian government, uh, the DSCI, uh, Dr. Sanjay Behel uh, at DG Sardin, and Her Majesty's government representative, Lieutenant Colonel Mark. So. Uh, if you were to look at uh, such an incident to escalate at such a pace, how do UK and India's national cyber security strategies help govern incident response? How should government and industry collaborate? Uh, should they work together to handle such an incident? Uh, Rama, if you would like to go first. Can you hear me? Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so to take the question, I mean, uh, rather than restrict myself to this specific scenario, I think where industry and government collaborate is collaborating, and where we can do a little, uh, a little more on this front is first of all being more prepared for de detecting or reducing the cycle time to detect a breach. I think we are moving in that direction rather than just how do we prepare ourselves to respond to a breach. Of course, emergency response measures, whether it's a regulator asking its organizations like banks or industry preparedness or organizations like CERT will continue to play a very important role in terms of emergency response. But I think both industry and government nodal organizations are moving towards how do we build higher capability and preparedness to reduce the cycle time to detect in case there is a likelihood of an attack or a big breach and what are we doing in terms of better threat hunting or threat intelligence collaborating with global industry security research organizations or with global nodal organizations like certs so that we get the threat intelligence for a proactive uh, risk mitigation i think we are moving towards that particularly from the industry and also some of the large user enterprises we are seeing this uh, equal investments or focus of the management in terms of being prepared to detect rather than just respond and uh, mitigate the risks. So we are looking at not only uh, industry investing in state of the art SOCs, but a lot of industry members are moving towards setting up cyber defense centers and investing in threat intelligence platforms. So we are beginning to see that and where we are collaborating and we have seen a lot of improvement in the last two, three years, at least as industry members is, the proactive role that national organizations like CERT are playing, where advisories are coming or when there is a big attack. We have seen this when WannaCry was, uh, you know, the WannaCry hit all of us. There was a proactive role that CERT played, interacting with CISOs, giving out advisories, webinars. And we at DSA, DSCI play as an anchor organization letting industry collaborate with nodal organizations and sometimes if a breach similar to this uh, mock story that was narrated uh, happens you know sometimes there is also collaboration with law enforcement that is needed DSCI has a cyber labs initiative and a digital forensics team which facilitates the collaboration between the user enterprise or an industry member which is facing a threat like this or an attack like this to not only interact with organizations like CERT, but also with the law enforcement, because sometimes there needs to be this investigation support with the foreign peer investigation organizations, because the cyber breach is not just within the boundaries. So we play a catalyst or a facilitating organization where subject matter experts or CISOs can share 
their expertise. Sometimes it, the attack could be in an organization whose cyber security readiness is not at the level of maturity that is needed. We connect them with some of the experts in the CISO community. So this is the role that we play and we feel there's a lot more that can be achieved by collaborating. Thanks, Rama. Sanjay, your thoughts? Uh Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here. Audible? Absolutely. <coughs> Louder? Okay. So I think uh, Rama has uh, actually covered the whole gamut of uh, work that should be done uh, between the government and uh, the industry. Uh, having said that, the Information Technology Act has identified the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team as the nodal agency for incident response and uh, certain has uh, you know MOUs and bilateral agreements with various certs, including the UK cert. So when it comes to uh, interactions for handling such incidents, this is something that can be leveraged. Uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, inputs that the industry can provide. It can actually start sharing information and intelligence because a whole lot of products, networks, etc., like I saw BT, etc., here. So if you're using some of those networks, a lot of information of incidents or attacks happening is directly available with them. And that is something that can be passed on to trusted agencies or trusted partners. Uh, also, the industry can help in uh, capacity building on, uh, on various fronts, uh, whether it is to look at uh, threat hunting, whether it is forensics, etc. And also, uh, from the government perspective, what can go back to the industry is what are the sort of patterns they are seeing in terms of the TDPs and who are the sort of attackers so that that can be a trusted relationship that can be set up and information shared. So th that broadly is something that can be looked at. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Um, at the high level, I'm not going to say anything massively different to what's been said before because that's what we're trying to do. And certainly NCSC, which we heard about earlier, that does the CERT function for UK. However, just two elements within that, um, which might be of interest, Firstly, the UK has set up a, a cyber information sharing partnership. So it's an online portal. So when we're sharing information with companies, it's not a secure thing by any stretch of imagination, but it is an invite only. So this is how the UK can share information with, with trusted partners. And we'll push out additional information than what you could get online. Because NCSE ultimately belongs to GCHQ, our signals intelligence. So they can push in intelligence that wouldn't be available elsewhere to help companies react to react to incidents. But the key, I think the key difference in what the tri UK is trying to do in dealing with industry is it's trying to work collaboratively. The UK tries to avoid, wherever it can, any form of legislation in terms of having to report, in terms of dealing with the government. The view being that if NCSE is the National Information Assurance Advisory Board, if they were also the people who are having to leverage fines or penalties, actually the companies won't speak to them. Why would you want to speak? Why would you admit stuff to people who are then going to smack you with a rod about it? It's not going to happen. So the view was, okay, if we work together, if there's any legislation, let that happen with the regulators, so Bank of England, for example. If we work together, actually you're much more likely to get two-way conversation flowing, and the companies are much more likely to admit things are going wrong and share that information. And indeed, the sharing platform does that, and it even allows people to post stuff anonymously. So your peers don't necessarily know who's posting the information. But it's all about sharing that information. And that's one of the key things for us. Thanks, Mark. Uh, that leaves us to a good point, uh, that there are a lot of breaches that are happening these days, and uh, there is a lot of penalties which the regulators are enforcing on uh, some of these companies. Uh, so my next question is to James and to Andy that uh, companies, how do companies manage their reputation uh, to ensure that uh, the consumer trust is maintained while such attacks happen? And uh, should this information be shared with the company's employees? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, so from the regulatory perspective uh, and the experience in the UK, uh, we receive round about 20,000 breach reports each year into the information commissioners office as is required under the GDPR, uh, 72 hour reporting window, so I'd hope the company in this scenario would be picking up the phone to us uh, at the same time usually in my experience as they pick up the phone to colleagues at the NCSC 
And we have a very good working relationship with colleagues at the NCSC. We don't share information about individual companies, but they inform us of the broad threat assessment. And we work together with other regulators to make sure that the companies aren't swarmed or swamped by regulatory questions in this initial incident management phase of whatever's, hap of whatever's happening. In terms of public confidence, because in the scenario, customers are already contacting on social media, so in many ways the cat is already out of the bag in this one, um, the phones would also be ringing off the hook in our office with members of the public wanting to know what they should do to protect themselves. So in the UK, what would typically happen is we would work with colleagues to put together advice for our citizens on how they can protect themselves, what measures they should be taking, and support the company and citizens over those first few hours of a breach. And ultimately, my experience of having dealt with many of these now, including Equifax, Uber, Facebook, and several of the others recently, is what inspires confidence in the company, is a clear, open line of communication, a commitment to supporting customers, and identifying those customers affected as quickly as possible, and giving them practical advice and reassurance about how they can protect their data. Thanks. Andy, your thoughts on open lines of communications? I think it's been covered uh, very, uh, you know, in detail. Uh, my only thing is come out with the truth to whatever you know is the truth. Don't try to cover up things because later on when the actual information does come out, that's where you lose your reputation. Some of you would have heard of the recent uh, case where data got leaked by the platform Cora. You should have read their, uh, you know, communication which went out to the public. It was absolutely professional and people were in fact, you know, telling that that's the way one should go about it. So. Keep it simple, keep it truthful, don't hide things that are already in Thanks. My next question is to Simon. Simon, there have been a lot of uh, cyber attacks which are happening. Do you see some commonality between the cyber attacks which are happening in India and UK? And how do you respond to this, these different kinds of attacks? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, I can talk certainly to what we kind of see in the UK at the moment. Um, there's obviously a, a range of different threat actors that we worry about. Um, and if you're, you can kind of chunk them up into, into, into sort of various different groups. I mean, at the, the kind of least sophisticated, but perhaps kind of most prevalent, it's your know, teenagers in bedrooms. Uh, you know, the, there have been some really high profile cases of... Uh, of people testing the boundaries, uh, but it's turned out that yeah, they've been sort of individuals uh, who've been sort of, sort of testing their own skills, and so you know, that that is something to worry about. But it, you've got to kind of look at the increasing sophistication of other groups. Um, sort of next level up might be what we call kind of hacktivists. I mean, these are people who uh, are really trying to affect the operation of companies and and to governments for an extent. You know, for for sort of purposes which are. Uh, maybe sort of political, social, uh, not necessarily for, for cost, but um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, getting able to the barriers to entry are quite low for that. Um, but as you go up, um, you know, then you're dealing with more sophisticated attacks, uh, particularly around fraud. You know, these are kind of sophisticated fraud networks uh, that are really out to do large-scale financial damage, uh, and we worry about that, you know, particularly. And that's kind of where the, the kind of mid-market stuff is um, however you know right at the top and this is the, the sort of thing that we concentrate on the company these are the the, the kind of state led state threats state actors um, that is that that's the kind of really difficult bit uh, that there's advanced persistent threats which uh, sit on sit on machines maybe uh, you know undetected for several months um, and that is really the, the kind of key worry uh, at the top end um, attribution for those is always quite difficult um, Although generally speaking, uh, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise. You know, in the UK context, specifically about Russia at the moment, you know, that is really the, the greatest threat that we, we kind of face. Uh, attack groups, Snake, particularly. Um, but that's not to say there aren't others. Uh, you know, there's some evidence of uh, Chinese activity and, and various different ones. So there's a, there's a range of different problems. Um, they demand sort of slightly different responses. But uh, I, mean, I think my overall message is you've got to have a plan in place before that. It's much better to have a plan in place and respond than it is to respond not having had a plan. Thanks, Simon. So Simon talks about having a plan in place. Uh, we talked about APTs. So we've got a company which is doing a lot of detection on APTs. And uh, many of you might be using it, uh, Darktrace. So uh, what is Darktrace's uh, thought on this? 
So uh, the APT in the sense, as in what doctors does, it's it's majorly detecting anything out of the blue, as in anything unknowns. So it, it's not any rules and signature based. So that that's the reason we detect anything which is known or unknown to anybody across the globe. So APT is again which has been known to the world. So there are companies which which say that we have detected one out of, one out of 30 APTs or something like that. Say they have a list of all APTs. But what Darkrays does, so I would. I would say that with the uh, with all the discussions we are having and with the presentation which was just shown, I would say the major key threat is the insider threat. So that's as in to detect that thing, you need to have a, a valid solution in place. And then the second would be so once once after you detect that, what can you do after that? As in to detect once it has been detected, so you have to slow it down. So that's the reason, so that's where you need something which can take response automatically. So it will take, as in, it will just buy you some time, as in buy the security team some time to stop, to, to just work on that and ju just to slow it down. So the same thing goes with the APT. If you find something with that, we just slow it down. So that's, uh, so that's it, as in, uh, anything else? Thanks. Uh, you mentioned about attacks uh, going undetected. Yes. And there are plenty of them. That's uh, correct. Wanted to get, uh, you know, thoughts uh, from James about uh, responding to you know, undetected attacks, and how do you, how do you put a team together? How do you work? So we would usually expect uh, companies and organisations to be putting in place a good level of security, which includes ongoing monitoring to make sure there is a minimisation of undetected attacks. We, when we go out and audit or assess a company, either in response to a tip off from a from a member of staff or a concerned customer or a board member. What we'll be looking for is we'll be looking for evidence of those strong accountability frameworks within the company to evidence to us as the regulator that they're taking their obligations seriously. And there's more information on this, uh, some joint guidance from ourselves and our colleagues at the National Cyber Security Center on uh, both of our websites, which sets out the baseline level of monitoring that we would expect to see. Thanks, James. Uh, there are a lot of guidelines in terms of how incidents should be reported and uh, regulations coming in terms of how they should be managed. So is there any commonality between India and UK in terms of how this should be done? Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, James, first, uh, in terms of uh, what could be the basic guidelines that could be followed uh, in terms of reporting cyber incidents and is there a common learning which we can draw from each other? I think the common lo the common learning we can draw from each other has already been ably set out before, which is you know, be open, be honest, be transparent. Um, as a re as a regulator, we dislike nothing more than finding out we've either been misled or things aren't quite as they seem. We fully get that in the early stages of an attack, there won't be all the answers and they won't be perfect. But engage with us, engage with your customers, be open and transparent. And actually, in the vast majority of cases, we don't issue any fines. Out of the many thousands of cases we look at each, each year, we issue a few dozen fines. And they are usually for the companies who have either misled us or who've had recklessly poor levels of security in place in the first place or have misled their customers. We save our fines for that end of the scale rather than necessarily those who've fallen victims to a sophisticated state actor or a, a sophisticated attack. Sure. I want to get Sanjay's thought on this because at least in India we have seen so many companies, uh, particularly in the enterprise segment, who are not uh, really sure whether they should report a particular incident uh, and uh, they are scared about uh, penalties which a sectoral regulator or a national level regulator would throw upon them. So Sanjay, what are your thoughts? So I agree to some of the comments that he's made. but. Uh, and also what Mark had mentioned. Uh, see, there there is a need for regulators. Regulation is necessary, and it says, uh, as for the IT Act, that incidents are mandatory to be reported. Having said that, uh, if you look at our track record, we haven't gone ahead and put any penalties as yet, and we have been uh, working in a trusted and collaborative manner. But that does not mean that you cannot put penalties. That clause is always available, and that route is always available. So if there is a necessity, that will be obviously uh, followed. And uh, as you mentioned, that there, there could be specific cases in which you want to follow that. Yes, I agree to that. 
but uh, also you have to understand uh, there is a maturity level that needs to be followed and also there is a responsibility on the organization and enterprises that they start doing all these activities. Absolutely. So if there is no responsibility, then you have to follow the other route. Absolutely. And uh, your thoughts, quickly your thoughts in terms of uh, taking certain learnings from the UK or sharing our experience uh, of what we have experienced recently uh, with the world, particularly around some of these incidents. No, I think uh, the collaboration that we've had with uh, UK CERT in some of the cases in terms of advisories and uh, uh, you know going out to the community or to our uh, stakeholders as well as during the wanna cry it was very evident how all the certs were collaborating so I think that's a fantastic model to be uh, looked at and adopted by others also because uh, the certs have a very trusted relationship and they follow a, a traffic like protocol mechanism which uh, should be adopted I think so uh, you're saying uh, the, the CERT in India collaborates with global certs and that's a model that should be put forward in terms of getting more collaboration in. Okay. Great, thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, uh, Manu, can we quickly move forward? Uh, sorry, I wanted to get a perspective from Robert. I missed the out, my apologies. Yes, I and planted uh, him just to be on the same side. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, what would be your uh, you know, initial response to such an incident get uh, detected or so good? Absolutely. Left? So, um, what I, one thing I, we talked a lot about how we do regulation, talking about reporting. Simon did start to talk a little bit about also what do you actually actually do in the middle in, in the middle of an attack, and this is something that we face on a daily basis. You know, we have 30 million consumer customers in the UK and 1.2 business customers. We have one of the largest networks in the world with one terabits of, per second of data flowing through it. And of that, there are 125,000 attempted cyber attacks every month that we block. And we've been very successful. And if I could reach the table, I would touch wood and say we have not had a major attack. But we know it, it will happen someday. So it's not about what if, it's when. And in order to address that, we recommend three key stages. So first of all, talking about the playbooks are absolutely essential. You do not want to be dealing with the crisis in real time. Almost like any other disaster preparedness. We often talk about cyber attacks, but they're just like any other disaster, uh, natural or otherwise. And having a disaster uh, recovery plan in place is essential. So have that playbook and start acting on it. You need to make sure that as part of that, you are containing the breach as fast as you can. You can almost think of incident responders as first responders. So you need to get them in, make sure that they uh, quickly identify the breach and contain it. The next thing you need to do is then also make sure that you are preserving the data, uh, your data and make sure that it doesn't get uh, uh, exfiltrated from your company. Again, your incident responders are absolutely key for that and there are a number of tools that they can use in order to ensure that data is not lost. But the final thing I will say is you need to have this process in place, but you need to stress test it. Don't wait for the cyber attack to happen to, make, to see if it works. You need to run exercises. You need to run red teaming. We even do something called purple teaming, uh, which is where we have our, 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 our ethical hackers work with our, our cyber stock analysts so that they can learn from each other to make sure that you are fully prepared in the event of an attack. So our scenario continues. We are at 19.04 hours. An emergency meeting of Konami's National Cyber Command Center, NCC, is convened where the NCCA director briefs members about a self-destructing malware found on MyPosis payment platform with its origin at online banking platforms of Konami's two biggest banks, Implore and Parador. The NCC suspects that these banks have been targeted with a watering hole attack, compromising their customer details and giving cyber criminals access to confidential customer and organizational data. It's Tuesday now, 2 or 8 hours. The incident responders at NCCA work with the <coughs> bank's security forensics to uncover the presence of a remote access Trojan RAT inside the hard drive of a senior manager's computer. 
This rat contains a family of various info-stealing malwares such as Carburp, Zeus and Torpig. NCCA alerts Konami's Computer Emergency Response Team, KSERT, asking them to join the probe. 403 hours. KSERT identifies a possible spear phishing email which downloaded the Trojan package on a senior manager's computer. They also discover this rat on the computers of the bank's administrators, principal officers, general managers, and high-level executives, and several employees with access to confidential information. They assess that the rat has been present in their computer's hard drive for close to two months. As a result, KSERT classifies this attack as an advanced persistent threat, APT. It raises a national security alert due to the threat to its entire financial services sector. 616 hours. Meanwhile, a security engineer at Parador removes the rat from the bank's computer in an attempt to help, but this only sets back KSERT's forensic investigation. Moderator, please. So we have our second uh, intervention here, and I'll go back to the panelist. Uh, given how the attack has escalated, you think uh, that the government agency should be brought in? You think this is the right moment? Or uh, should there be international help be sought from subject matter experts? Uh, Andy? I think uh, the regulator already knows about it. It's getting uh, news from the social media. The NCA has already, uh, you know, uh, come to know that it's uh, APT, which is there in the systems of the travel sites as, as well as the banks. And it's, I think, the right time now to bring in the government regulators and the agency. Because beyond this, you know, like just being told, we delayed more than 72 hours. And that's what makes it a cause to, you know, hold the gun against your head. So I think it's a good time to bring in the government agencies. And more so, this is a critical information sector, you know, the banking industry. Two banks have been, largest banks have been involved in it. So it's the right time to get in so that the other banks don't get or the financial institutions don't get impacted. Right? Uh, now, s imagine such an incident getting uh, happening in a country. Uh, should there be a national scale security alert? And uh, if there is a national scale security alert which is being launched, how would it impact? Uh, Rama, your thoughts? First thing is. I think there should be a national organization which is orchestrating this national alert. I would say a large scale cyber security attack is no different from a natural disaster or a extreme weather condition. So there is a national orchestration that is done by some agency, let's say the national disaster relief for somebody. Similarly for cyber security attack, I would say there has to be a national institution like a CERT or a sector role regulator if there is a sector role CERT and the user enterprises is getting affected, who coordinate and decide what that national alert should be. I mean, what is that information dissemination? What is the channel? What is the need to know who needs to be informed? Is it general public or is it all the peer organizations of that sector or is it, you know, the local state government and law enforcement? So I would like to see an orchestrated response coordinated by a national institution like CERT. Sanjay, your thoughts? You, uh, to trigger a national security alert, you have to be very clear, as uh, was mentioned, you first have to have a playbook. For example, in India, we have a playbook uh, and the cyber, uh, cyber crisis management plan very clearly lists out whether it needs to go up to that national level or not, and when does it need to go up to a national level, what are the roles and responsibilities of different organizations, and uh, uh, the stakeholders, okay, and what needs to be done. And yes, that is orchestrated uh, to a large extent by uh, certain specific things, and then uh, there are other entities who are doing their uh, uh, respective roles. So for example, we've got four different categories in that. One is it could be just an individual organization, so you obviously that is not, nothing going to be happening at the national level. Then the, uh, the second type of uh, uh, stage would be multiple organizations of one state uh, being impacted. Third is 
a particular sector or multiple uh, states being impacted. And then the fourth is multiple states, sectors, that's at the national level, right? So you have to have a graded uh, approach to this whole thing. Once you've seen what level it is, also uh, there is need for sharing information uh, with the specific organization or with the specific set of organizations. And that goes out in a structured manner through uh, the churning that we do and then send out the specific IOCs uh, so that the people can take necessary uh, advantage of those IOCs and intelligence that is sent out and then uh, put it in their respective organizations as controls so that it, the damage is not for the impact. There you go. So, so I think you have to have a very clear mechanism of how you want to grade it. You have to have that playbook in place and then as the threat landscape keeps changing, you need to start looking at or revisiting all these playbooks and make sure that this is a living document and not a static document. Mark, uh, your thoughts, if something like this would have happened uh, in the UK, you know, would you raise a national security alert? And what would be the impact of doing so? It's as easy to say it depends. Um, I think for something like this, I'd hope that National Cyber Security Centre, as the National CERT, would react, would be would be there. Because if it's something they're really concerned about, actually we will the government will send incident response teams to the to the organizations themselves to start digging through the information to find out the what's going on. But otherwise it's a we have our categories of how important, how disastrous is this, going from one which is no sorry, the other around six which is low level uh, sort of fraud to one everything's gone massively wrong. Um, and we haven't had a one yet. Touch wood. Um, but we've got close number of times. And actually, as it starts going up that thing, up that scale, NCSC takes the technical lead, because it's the cert, but the government starts stepping in as well. And so actually, you get the government organizations, the, the committees of, of politicians, who start having a say in how it's responded. Um, so usually, it's a fairly well-defined thing. The thing which will, I think, occasionally throw this off, and I'll look to my left to see this is right, um, if this has been, if everyone knows about this, NCSC, I think, will find themselves forced forward to be the spokesman for the government. Just say, yeah, we got this, give us a bit of time, and we'll get back to you. So there's a number of ways this can come about. But essentially, we have a playlist, and we do try and follow it, and we have very set levels of how we would react. Yeah, I just want to add, absolutely correct the same playlist and same uh, levels of attack and that's when the convergence of uh, you know the technical and the business side starts coming into play and that's where what he's saying whether it's the politicians or whether it's the government or whatever so you can see the clear convergence of uh, business side as well as the technical side coming Sanjay just I'll hold on uh, just hold on to that now such a scale of incident if it happens uh, and you raise the alert there is going to be panic so, how do you control what amount of information is shared with the public? See, what you need to share with the public is something that will help them uh, make sure that they can mitigate and take appropriate actions. Something that is going to hamper your investigation or uh, uh, your forensics, that is definitely not to be shared. But definitely all the other things which are correct for the public to know, which will help them and not create that panic on their uh, respective resources and assets is what something should be shared. And that is exactly what you saw uh, when the WannaCry happened. There was uh, a lot of details which were sent out by certain itself to the media and through our own uh, website as to what the public needs to do. We also did a webcast so that the people are clear as to what is happening, what they need to do, how they need to do. But obviously, the other investigations which are happening, which would, could have hampered if it was in public domain, uh, obviously, that is not shared. Okay. And uh, is there any specific regulation in India around this? Or a set, set, set of guidelines, what information should be shared with public and what needs to be kept confidential, particularly some of these incidents which impact national security? To what extent you would allow the information to be shared with public channel? Because there, there is going to be sentiment, right? And there is going to be media which is going... I don't okay. think it's uh, as simple as having regulation around this. Tomorrow, the type of incidents, as, as he did mention earlier, the sophistication is increasing. And, and the nature of incidents is going to keep changing. 
So are you going to keep changing regulation on a daily basis? It's not possible. Rama, your thoughts on specifically some of these incidents. Uh, you believe there has to be some guideline which decides how much information should be shared. And so Sanjay tells there is no such guideline, but you believe that there has to be some, some playbook. No, not specifically guidelines, but definitely there is some framework that is needed. Because I think creating a panic situation or a scaremongering situation is the last thing we want when there's a real national security emergency, right? So I think if it's a general public, uh, there is a need to know basis. For example, if there's a big data breach and a certain uh, bunch of users have to be, uh, you know, advised to change their identity or their passwords and things like that. How do you do that uh, communication? Sometimes it's not just sending the user enterprise, sending the SMSs or emails. Maybe we need to use some public channels. I think in such an emergency, definitely uh, there needs to be some framework of do's and don'ts of responsible media communications. I think that is one thing that uh, we do see a challenge where uh, when if there is a breach like this, what is the way media can play a positive role in disseminating the right information so that uh, we reassure the audiences on how the thing is being tackled. What am I saying is right. You have to have a responsible mechanism for uh, you know communicating all this, but th that is not from a regulatory perspective. That's at an organization level, and that's where you have to have your policies in place. And that shows the maturity of the organization as to how they are handling and what is the communication channel they're going to use. And as, as he gave the example of Quora, so you, you know, they're, they're in front of you. But like, for example, Facebook happened. Do you see the US government coming out and saying it? Or is it supposed to be Facebook? Thanks, Sanji. Uh, Mark, quickly, your thoughts on this. I, I think I'd echo it. It's the, it is down, I think, generally to the companies. We would, uh, for those who work on secure information, there are different mechanisms for They know what they can and can't share. So unless there is a specific reason from the government, I can't think of any off the top of my head, for not releasing information, release as much as possible, as early as possible. Simon? Yeah, it's interesting to hear the, the kind of government perspective, but it's only half the story. I mean, companies themselves need to be thinking about what they're going to have to do. And uh, we mentioned earlier about having a plan and trialing that and, and backup facilities. You know, if you, you know, maybe the answer isn't always just to unplug everything. You know, uh, it, it's one answer, but it doesn't necessarily help with your forensics. Um, and I think the point I, I want to make that is that companies themselves need to think about the kind of, not just the preparations, but the kind of contractual frameworks they have with business in advance and um, you know to be honest coming coming out to industry when you've got a problem and the, the house is on fire that can be pretty costly and, and, and difficult and yeah, it can be done of course but there are other ways of looking at it like, you know, framework contracts um, that you might have in advance where you know what you're going to be charged you're going to have a relationship with, with a provider uh, up to you know, really full kind of contracts that that you have with, with people retained so a lot of it's about preparation and not just a plan it's about having some of the kind of contractual relationships with providers that you might need having those in advance. Absolutely. Robert, yeah, your thoughts? So just to build on that. So actually, one of the things that we often find with a lot of our customers is they don't even know where their data is. And this is getting worse and worse as more and more people, more and more people use mobile devices, and particularly when they start using third-party cloud services. It is very easy to actually lose control of where your data is residing. And that, leaves, that it increases the potential attack surface. So what we think is very important is, first of all, given that you probably won't be able to, uh, uh, to protect all your data, make sure you know what data is absolutely critical for protection. Once you've do, done that, you need to educate your employees on, how, on, on good data security hygiene to make sure that they don't make the silly mistakes like leaving USB sticks on trains, which we've certainly uh, heard of before. And then finally, there are some simple controls that you could put into your cloud security architecture to help at least try to manage the security of that data. First of all, by helping, uh, you could use discovery tools to discover where your data resides. You could use uh, tools such as data loss prevention, which could help to make sure that, non -crit that critical data stays within the organization. And then there are other tools, particularly on the threat management side, or even I could even reference Darktrace, which could help to detect where unusual data flows, which actually might be identifying a particular breach. Thanks, Mark. So uh, 
in terms of we talked about investigating certain incidents like this which happened and they can scale beyond companies and can impact national security so you know of course we have cert uh, who are doing the incident response but shouldn't there be a national cyber crime uh, agency in place uh, india uk which would holistically look at just some of these incidents which would scale beyond a particular enterprise and impact nation as a whole as a whole yeah. james your thought uh, yes, I think it would be good to have such an agency. We do in the UK. We, uh, it's a criminal offence to steal data in the, in the UK uh, un under the Data Protection Act, and we are a prosecuting authority. We carry out investigations, um, and at the very large scale, we work with our colleagues at the National Crime Agency Cybercrime Unit who do excellent work in this front as well. So, um, as has already been mentioned, pr you know, the planning and the preparation is all absolutely vital. Um, but also some of these larger incidents do then become effectively crime scenes and have to be managed in that way. Thanks. Mark, your thoughts in terms of some of these uh, incidents being handled at a national level? So how, what's been your experience? Um, NCSC does a great job handling stuff at national level. It wants to do as little as possible. Um, it works quite hard to try and get companies try and get government departments to be able to manage it themselves. I'm MOD. I, we are expected to be good at this stuff. Yeah, sometimes we are. Um, but there is that expectation. We will, the government only wants to manage the stuff that the sectors can't do themselves. If it's a cross sector or there's some massive impact, yeah, by all means, we'll, we'll step in because we've got to. But I think on the whole, yeah, the UK government wants industry to do it itself and is trying to provide all this encouragement to do so at one end and occasional sticks at the other end. But yeah, we want to do as little as possible if we can. Responding to some of these incidents or maybe have a framework in place to handle such threats. As I said, CERT is the national nodal agency for this. Okay, and we have frameworks in place for this. That, having said that, under 70A and 70B of the Act, there is NCIPC as well as 13. It is not necessary that every incident is going to be a leading towards crime. So you also have to understand that. If it is leading towards crime, yes, uh, we have entities within the Ministry of Home Affairs which handle these things, and that's when your uh, MLATs and other things come into picture. But also at a national level, when you're doing some coordination, if things of that sort are required, that's when you have the Office of the National Cyber Security Coordinator. So it's all accordingly coordinated from there, and then different entities who need to be pulled in, or different agencies that need to be pulled in are pulled in. So the framework is there, everything is there accordingly for the necessary things to work. We mentioned uh, quite a number of organizations which are there. So is there a set protocol who gets involved at what stage? That's why I said it is all there, and it's all uh, listed out very clearly in the National Cyber uh, Crisis uh, Management Plan. Thanks. Uh, moving on, uh, so there, some of these incidents actually lead to a lot of data loss. Uh, so is there specific learning which we can take to prevent from, uh, this data loss from happening? Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Me, Mark? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Yes, I think this is generally more company space than it's government <laughs> space. Uh, <laughs> encryption Just is an answer. <laughs> uh, encryption is an answer for some data which is at rest. Um, we, we are looking much closer now at where our data is, how it's accessed, how it is controlled. The UK MOT has taken the decision to shift everything into the cloud. So we've gone entirely off as 365 as a, as a government department, and other government departments are doing the same, but we still believe we can defend it. But, there, but we are sticking, some of the controls uh, around the data are specifically for data assurance in terms of um, defending it. A lot of it now is also being driven by the requirements of GDPR. Actually knowing what's in that data set so you know what personal information is there, Actually, we're seeing more laws about that more recently than we are about specific, you must defend this. Robert? Yeah, so I would, I would echo um, what Mark just said. 
Uh, so it, again, some of the lessons that we learned, and this is a bit of re uh, repeating what I said earlier, is just making sure that there is, um, that companies really have a good understanding of where their data resides, because it really can be just about anywhere. You don't want to adopt a, restri a, 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 um, a, a regime and set of policies that overly restrict the use of data. We talked, we've been talking a lot about data flows in many different contexts throughout this conference. And we all recognize that the free flow of data is, uh, or at least the controlled flow of data, is absolutely important for the economic development of both the UK and India. So we don't want to restrict that from a pure cybersecurity perspective, but we do need to make sure that it is being done within a security framework. There's, uh, there are c things that government can do, but also businesses themselves having the right security architecture, and one that's been designed for today's world, where, which allows com uh, their personnel to leverage the best in cloud services that many of the people here today are developing, but can do it in a way with the knowledge that they know they are, are able to do it in a secure manner. Those are the, some of the key lessons that we've learned. I'll hold on, just hold on to that. So a lot of times, you know, even uh, large service providers don't have their data. They have third party service providers who are actually processing the information, and they hold the data. So sh should the rules be different for them? It's not, it's not so much that the rules should be different from them, but one of the things that we also find with some of, uh, particularly some of our smaller customers, is they uh, just assume that if they use AWS or Azure or, or Alibaba or any other third cl uh, party cloud provider, that they don't have to worry about security because the third party cloud service will provide that security. But that's simply not true. They will provide an element of security for their third party cloud service because they need to protect their reputation. It's the same motivation for all of our customers and why they implement securities. Ultimately, they're trying to protect their reputation. At the same time, it really is a shared responsibility model. They may provide an element of security of their infrastructure, but they're not going to guarantee the security of the data that resides on, that you have put there. Nor are they going to be able to guarantee that the wrong people in your company are accessing that data. That is where the company comes in and needs to make sure that they are implementing a cloud, a cloud security architecture that, of course, incorporates the third-party cloud services, but also recognizes where the third-party cloud service ends and the private company begins. Simon, you wanted to sh share your perspective. Uh, yeah, I was okay. just going to say that uh, the kind of things that you need to do to, to get good cybersecurity are not terribly complicated. I mean, they are... There are models for it. I mean, the, the classic one is pr prepare, protect, monitor, respond that, that we use for. Um, but it, as, as um, Robert was, was sort of hinting at, it's actually not just about the technology, really. You know, you can have, you can have those, the technology there and you have the processes. I mean, we, we tend to find it's about the people that's the key thing there. So when companies are thinking about the kind of threats that they face, it's actually there's a mixture between those three processes, uh, those three things to get right, technology, process, and people. Yeah, I just want to what Robert said is, uh, you know, increasingly when you look at an enterprise's entire IT platform and solutions, it, diver it, you know, it gets hosted by multiple service providers. It's not just that you have one turnkey system integrator who's taking care of that. I think we still, especially when you look at small and mid-sized organizations, this third party and intermediary liabilities and how are you contracting them where roles and responsibilities and liabilities are clearly defined. Uh, the tendency of a customer is to put all the liabilities with the front-end turnkey service provider. And sometimes they are not really in control of that. And it's not just one cloud provider. Sometimes storage is with one cloud provider. Your maybe core banking, or not core banking, maybe the internet banking is on a third, another cloud provider. How do you deal with this entire supply chain ecosystem which is provisioning your digital infrastructure? I think where there is a challenge is the maturity of the procuring organization which is and the legal organization which is writing these complex contracts. I think maybe the large enterprises are scaling up, the small and mid-size. So when there is an emergency, I think this is where the challenge comes in. And another point I wanted to add to Robert was a robust data classification framework. I think that is missing in a lot of public organization and again mid-sized organization. That, that data classification framework is absolutely critical for a data loss prevention solution to work in the first place. They're complex to implement, but once they're implemented, they can help to, again, make sure that you know what your crown jewels of data are, and you can focus your security efforts on those crown jewels. Your, so you mentioned about cloud. Now, a lot of this data classification needs to happen on cloud. Mm -hmm. 
So we've got solutions which could do data classification on cloud as well. Oh yes, absolutely. So most of the most of the um, providers out there can, uh, can make sure to enforce the data classification rules, uh, uh, regardless of whether it's on premise or in the cloud, because that framework is uh, defined by the company, and so the company can just extend that framework. There happen to be some specialized solutions out there called cloud access security brokers, uh, which we uh, work with, which we incorporate into the architectures we build to our customers that have been specifically designed to secure uh, employee access to uh, cloud services. But as part of that solution, they can also help to monitor the data and enforce data classification rules, again, to make sure that, we, uh, that the, most of the security efforts are directed at that most critical information. James, your thought? I wouldn't disagree with m much as what has gone before, and certainly, as with the MOD, the ICO is also on the cloud and manages to secure its data, thankfully, and I'll touch every piece of wood that I can while I'm here. Um, but, you know, the comments that have been made, I would absolutely endorse, and those kinds of things are, as a regulator, the things I draw assurance from. Um, if you look at many of our big finds recently, the things we don't draw assurance from and the things we still hear too often are, we didn't know that team worked that way. We didn't know we had data there. Um, we didn't know why we kept that. We should have got rid of it years ago. Um, that's the kind of things that come up to bite you later on. Actually, one, one thing just to, to, to build on that, because you had mentioned about not realizing where data is, one of the biggest uh, challenges that, com uh, that companies or public bodies moving to the cloud, actually most of the time their employees were already there because they've already taken advantage of, of, of capabilities such as Dropbox or, um, or, or Box or, or any of those other uh, cloud services that were, and they, they don't do it maliciously. They did it because it made their lives easier. It made it so that they can access this information on their mobile devices, maybe before that organization uh, officially allowed them to do so. So again, it's tools like the CASB tools I mentioned before can help to identify that shadow IT, and that's probably the first area you need to focus. But it, you don't necessarily just shut it down, you have to replace it with something that the employees will want to use in an easy way so that they won't continue to try to go around your security policy. So uh, in terms of some of these uh, solutions which are getting implemented, uh, from an incident response point or from detecting some of these cyber attacks which are happening these days. What is Darktrace really doing? Uh, I would like to uh, reiterate the same thing which I said earlier, that is Darktrace, idly, it detects all the unknown threats and the known threats. So uh, listing out few is one of the insider threats. Ransomwares, we detect a lot uh, in multiple uh, customers. And a uh, few more things that after detection, what's next? So the so first thing is you don't want the problem to become the crisis. So you should stop it when it started. So that, that's the key thing for which doctors has a second solution, which is for the autonomous response. So that helps to stop any problem which might become a crisis at a later stage. So you, you can stop it at the day one itself. Why to wait for the doomsday? So is there like a command response blueprint? Uh which you people... Command and response blueprint, yeah. Because Darktrace is totally based on, the, it, not based on any rules and signatures. So there is no command response blueprint, but the command response blueprint, an organization can have a command response blueprint. And that would, I would uh, like to just uh, give a, there's the RACI mat matrix, RACI, which can be utilized by organizations to create their own matrices, which can decide, which can help them decide that who will be responsible for any incident which has happened, who can audit that, who can consult on that, who can be informed, like the CISO, CRO, CS, CIOs at a later stage, or the normal managers, like, depends on the incident. It totally depends on the incidents. Thanks. Uh, moving forward, Manu. Thanks, uh, panelists. Moving on. Moving on with the scenario. It's Tuesday, 8.23 hours. On social media, hashtags such as Im hashtag implore breached, hashtag parador heast, hashtag is your money safe are trending nationwide. Media is reporting that a multi-million dollar information breach has taken place at implore and parador, quoting anonymous sources. Audio interviews are starting to circulate online of various security engineers criticizing implore and parador's senior managers for ignoring their recent information security audit 
which had found serious flaws in the cybersecurity solutions supplied by the company Nevorus. The engineers also allege that Nevorus only won the contract through bribing top banking officials. 10.03 hours. The leaked tapes and documents create mayhem for Nevorus's share price at the Konami Stock Exchange, KSE, losing more than 10% of its market value. 10.17 hours. KCERT begins to receive alerts from more companies listed on KSE, suggesting that they are also affected by the same rat, which confirms KCERT's classification of this as an advanced persistent threat. While KCERT's investigation is ongoing, stocks of affected companies continue to fall dramatically. KSC regulator KB steps in and temporarily halts trading for these companies. 10.23 hours. Parador, Implore and Nevorus' spokespersons hold press conferences demand denying allegations of a Nevorus' bribe and ignoring their security audit. They blame social media for propagating fake news. 12.07 hours. Just minutes before the expiry of the trading halt, renowned news agency KFP tweets that the CEOs of Implore and Parador banks have been asked to resign by their board of directors and that Konami government will review all its cybersecurity contracts in the wake of the bribery allegations. 12.15 hours. Within minutes, various government departments deny these tweeted claims and the bank issues a statement rebutting claims of their CEO's resignations. KFP's release a statement confirming its Twitter handle has been hacked and its earlier tweets were not authentic. 17.21 hours. The NCC Council under the Konami Prime Minister suspect the attack was conducted by a neighboring state, Spira, with both political and financial motivations. Moderator. So we see a lot of fake news uh, getting spread these days and uh, taking from the scenario, there have been instances of fake news CEO getting, CEO resigning, and then uh, the organization saying that that was fake news. Uh, Sanjay, I wanted to get your thoughts. You know, some of these incidents once they once they get reported, and uh, media gets involved. A lot of times, social media starts to play news which is not original. And uh, so, how, from cert standpoint, uh, you know, what's your take in terms of putting in the right information or giving them an advisory in terms of what to basically believe and what not to believe? That's a very simple thing that you need to go straight to the CERT website. If you want the right details, go to the CERT handle if you want the right details. Okay, now uh, having said that, if there is uh, uh, issues of fake news, I think uh, there are, there's a need for the media to be you know, educated upon how do you identify fake news so that they are more responsible and they don't spread it. And accordingly, uh, uh, I think there are enough of countries now coming out with regulations for fake news and penalties for fake news. So I think uh, as more and more adoption of digital technologies happen, there will be more and more such emerging cases. And uh, I think I it's a learning exercise for everyone. And let's see how it uh, takes off, where it goes. And also, uh, let's see what comes out in the uh, Data Protection Act that is uh, being envisaged. Uh, James, I wanted to get your thoughts specifically on fake news. There have been a lot of fake news which has been spread in terms of uh, Russia doing a lot of attacks and... Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, sort of tackling this issue of fake news, I think to be trying to tackle it at this point is you're probably already on the back foot. Uh, as colleagues have, all, have already said, you know, the importance of an appropriate playbook for your organization should include a strong comms line within that. If you've been open and upfront from the start of the incident and you are the trusted source of information and news about that incident, that will help mitigate any kind of fake news. Uh, part of the UK coordination response, as Mark has alluded to, is that single clear authoritative voice, depending on the nature of the incident, whether that's colleagues at the NCSC, colleagues in law enforcement, colleagues at Action Fraud, or colleagues back at the ICO. Communications is a core strand of this. In terms of fake news in general, this is uh, an issue of concern. Uh, in the UK, as you'll be aware, our parliament has opened an inquiry into fake news and disinformation. From our perspective at the office, uh, in examining the Cambridge Analytica Facebook incident, 
identifying some of the issues that had happened there around micro-targeting of adverts and political messaging, we've reported to our Parliament our findings there and our recommendations for how Parliament should take forward those, those findings. Thanks. Andy, your thoughts in terms of handling some of these fake news? I think when too many people are communicating at all levels, this is what normally happens. So therefore, like everybody is telling, you've got to have an identified agency in a case like this where multiple financial institutions are impacted. You've got to have only certain people who approve, approve to give statements on that. And then this fake news, you know, you can overcome the malaise of that. Otherwise, if in every organization, every person starts giving his own perspective of what it is, or what's happening, then there's going to be chaos. So you're saying there has to be a communication strategy and a communication plan? Uh, That's a part of a playbook. Like it's being brought up. That's part of a playbook. Uh, Robert, Simon, your thoughts in terms of uh, some of these uh, communication studies, strategies and plans being in place for handling fake news? There's nothing much to add apart from have one in place, practice it in advance and keep your, uh, keep your comms director close. Yeah. Would you like a comment from the audience? Uh, I'll, I'll open the floor for questions. But uh, it's fine, it's fine. you want to add something? Um, I thought you might like to hear uh, about fake news from the horse's mouth. <laughs> so um, I've been working on the fake news aspect. We were working, working with the Home Ministry um, on making advisory on this. And uh, I'm a Supreme Court lawyer and I work on tech law. And as a policy, India is going to very soon have a you know fake news law. So, But in the meantime, we are having an advisory on this issue. And another suggestion which is very welcoming is uh, the industry bodies can congregate and formulate uh, an association like the News Broadcasters Association is already there in India. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, when I was consulting, you know, I was a consultant for one of the projects where an online news portal was being launched. Uh, the debate was whether to do it from India or set up the company in Netherlands. And the, why, the question I asked the client was, you're an Indian, you're already having an established business, you want to venture into an online news agency space, why would you want to consider setting up the company in Netherlands? He says, I'm scared of, you know, having this, uh, you know, the law is not... Uh, foolproof at the moment but then that's the case in every country we are all struggling with new issues which are emerging so I told them that uh, as far as India is concerned uh, you will be surprised to know but for the online space we don't have a particular uh, regulatory license also required for online news agencies so that's that's the reason why this question this problem is emanated to that extent and mob lynching attacks were being reported on social media and huge uh, you know chaos occurred but we are soon going to have this law in place thank you so much Robert your thoughts I, mean, I, I don't know if I have much more to add to what's been said before I think again uh, going back to the playbook that everyone's mentioned the playbook is not just about how do you deal with a disaster, it is also about your communications plan. I would also would want to iterate that one of the biggest challenges sometimes with these situations is the multiple spokespeople. So there really has to be a single person that it needs to be the face of the company. That person needs to be uh, informed as much as possible so that they're telling the, the one story rather than hearing multiple stories from multiple sources. Thank you. Uh, now as these uh, incidents have basically evolved, now they start to impact uh, national security, also impact citizen safety. Uh, so should there be a model to handle some of these attacks? Simon, your thoughts? Um, I don't know about a model. I mean, I, I think w one of the, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about sort of threat to life right at that kind of top end of uh, yeah, problems. And um, you know, I think it's difficult to think of an attack that we've kind of known about that would deliberately you know, kind of target someone's life. I mean, that, that would almost, you know, be illegal under any set of circumstances. But I, I guess it, it's, it's only a matter of time until something goes wrong to the extent that people are, you know, kind of physically impacted by, by things. Um, I think one of, the, one of the kind of key challenges for both industry and government is, is about around critical national infrastructure and about trying to work out, you know, uh, clearly, at the top end, there are pieces of critical national infrastructure, nuclear power stations, defence facilities. You know, the government has got to be has got to be on top of that. But you know, there are pieces of critical national infrastructure which are much lower down. You know, local councils, health services, um, you know, traffic light systems in provincial towns, and um, you know, there's evidence of compromise in quite a lot of those particular 
particular sort of systems, and then you're getting into quite a difficult space about who, you know, who's responsible for that, um, and what would happen, you know, if, if there were, you know, a, a, a kind of uh, large scale something that really affected a large NHS hospital and people died as a result. Um, so I think, it, you know, there's a graduated response. We've been probably lucky so far, but I think it's only a matter of time before something goes wrong. Yeah, just to add to what Simon was saying, particularly this, the, the, the idea of, of, of local councils. So we have a tendency to talk about public sector as if it's this monolith. But actually, m public sector comes from um, all the way up from the MOD to Cambridge County Council, as an example. A lot of those local councils, regardless of whether what country they're in, they're often cash-strapped. They have a lot of demands on their funding, on their budgets. And so oftentimes, because they, need, they have uh, mandates on how they must spend their funding, they don't have enough money left to spend on uh, on security, so those they can occasionally be actually a particularly um, vulnerable uh, vector of attack. We need to all, we need to make sure that local councils understand their security obligations, but also make sure they have services that they can easily consume, be, uh, because many of those local councils are, are are just as sophisticated as a small business. So they need to make sure that there's a security service that is easy for them to deploy, easy th for them to manage, or have someone like BT or BAE manage for them. Thanks. James, my next question is to you. So as uh, the attack vectors begin to target uh, you know, and impact human life, so should the incident level be raised? Is there a set process in UK which you follow if you see such kind of an attack happening? So, so this would be a dynamic process. It would be, you know, we would be meeting or speaking to each other by telephone or video conference quite frequently in response to every new input that's been made and that would be one of the ass assessments you know what is the level what is the categorization of this incident what is the response who is the lead it's not unheard of for the lead to change between either a sector regulator a national government agency or the information commissioner's off office we would keep that in mind we'd also be updating citizens and we'd be considering both the, the sort of national response, but also the personal response. How can we advise our citizens? What do they need to do to keep themselves sell, to keep themselves safe? But also, what do we need to do to bring people to, to book for, for this? You know, we would be engaging with our colleagues at the National Crime Agency, beginning to deploy field teams in to look at evidence, looking at the servers, beginning to take statements to drive forward that next phase of the investigation. Thanks. And uh, my next question uh, is specifically around how can we prevent such attacks from happening? You know, what can be the best practices which we can work forward to? Uh, so uh, I think there are a number of things that uh, companies can do and that we have learned, again, through our engagements throughout the years. And I would invite Simon also to, uh, to contribute as well because he would have a similar perspective. So uh, first of all, one of the first things to do is to fix the basics. So again, what, a, what, what we have found, uh, we recently did a survey uh, of a number, of, our, of, a number of, of major corporations, and something like 37% of, uh, of those companies had over 50 plus security vendors in their networks. Very, we, I've also used, sometimes used the term security sediment. Uh, that in some ways may sound like they must be awfully secure, but that is awfully difficult to manage and you're very likely to have vulnerabilities because these different vendors don't always talk to each other or share information. So absolutely fix the basics. The second thing you need to do is make sure you're investing for, for, the, for future attacks and not trying to invest for past attacks. Very often what happens is a, a company is attacked, they then try to plug that vulnerability and then the, and the next attack happens. They need to be investing in tools that will help them to anticipate attacks rather than uh, always investing for last year's attack. I think the third, I'm going to combine the third and fourth into a single point. So as part of that investment, you, uh, automation is absolutely key. There have been other conversations here today around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Cybersecurity is absolutely one of the key consumers of that technology because that the volume of cyber attacks is growing so great. You absolutely need some sort of uh, AI capability. But the, the other thing I will absolutely say is you need to also be investing in people. We are no longer, we are not at a stage yet where we can completely trust the machines to catch all those cyber attacks. You need to have people with sophistication who can understand and do the analysis. Uh, BT, we here in India, and we actually have some of our representatives here today from our SOC, our cyber SOC, are some of those key people. Ultimately, what we want to do, we, we, while maybe someday we may be able to build Terminators, really what we want to build are Iron Men. 
making sure that we have our expert people armed with the sophisticated tools that they need to pr uh, protect our customers. Simon? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think if Robert's kind of looked at the maybe the kind of commercial sphere. I might just touch on some of the government uh, sphere of clients of ours. Um, uh, uh, you know, what can governments do to protect themselves? Well, you know, and the, there are sort of things that you, you need to do beforehand, understand the threat environment, uh, have a good understanding of threat intelligence feeds. Uh, then you can you know, build yourself a security operations center. You can have tools like that in, in place, analytics on top of it. Um, but as Robert said, it really, even in the government space, really comes down to people. Uh, uh, you know, India's blessed in this regard. You know, it has, <laughs> at least from the point of view of the UK, you know, you, you, you know, you, 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 you we do hopefully have a have a deeper pool. And um, we we in the UK, you know, we really struggle, I think, to, to find to find all the right talent that we need. And partly one of the problems is by the time you realise you've got a problem, it's kind of five years too late. You needed to have started five years ago. You know, really changing the computer science courses taught in universities and getting those accredited and changing the accrediting bodies. And um, you know, we found as a company, you know, the, the, the big challenges are really sort of reaching back into that human supply chain. You know, f uh, and it's going to take five or six years before those people come through trained in the right way um, uh, uh, and kind of ready, ready for the kind of tasks ahead of them. Sure. Rama, uh, DSCI has been doing a lot of work, especially around skill development and training. Would you like to throw some light on the work which is being done? Just to add on to the comments uh, which uh, Robert and Simon talked about, I think one of the best ways to be able to deal with future attacks is best practice sharing of the current and the past attacks. We don't do enough of that. DSCI tries to do its best where we get CISOs together. For example, recently we had the global uh, CISO of Equipax who came and did a complete uh, you know, debrief on how the organization dealt with the breach and what did they do so that they're prepared for the future. In terms of skills development, I think one of the things which has been core to our charter for the last 10 years is law enforcement capability building in cyber crime investigation and uh, forensics. And the second one is creating the talent pool. So the NASCOM and DSCI Cyber Sector Skills Council, Cyber Security Skills Council has created uh, role maps for uh, 30 job roles and we've built the curriculum and we're taking that to the educational institution, security analysts, forensics, across the various uh, ladders of the skills matrix. And recently we have started an initiative where young women engineers are being trained in cyber security so that they can be ready for the workforce. But, uh, and very advanced workshops sometimes we do, whether it's red teaming exercises, red teaming and blue teaming exercises. Now there are some training providers who are able to do that for the CISOs in the community. But still, I think we are just addressing you know, less than 10% of the problem that we have on here. Thanks, Rama. Uh, i now open the floor for any questions from the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Mark, we have recently seen in the USA election, President Trump election was uh, just like uh, by Putin. Do you think it can happen with the rest of the world also, or 9-11 or other things are happening? So some country can come together, they can influence the political system of other country? Can it happen in other places? Yes, is the quick answer. Um, I seem to remember the, the French also had, a, had an issue which was similar when they, when they had data hacked. But this is, to me, this is less a cybersecurity thing. This is ju this is information warfare in my language. This is just people using cyber as just another way to manipulate stuff. Um, it happened in the American example that state actors were attacking a, a political party's um, defences, and defences weren't good enough. And in fact, there were two different state actors from the same country, both attacking the same thing simultaneously. Um, yes, it could happen elsewhere. I like think the Cambridge Analytics, they also influence the elections. That, <laughs> that I don't have any details. Certainly that seems to be the general impression. But again, this is about, this goes back a bit to the, sort of the, the fake news, the management at the national level of how some of these 
social media and other companies organize their, their data. Cambridge Analytics did a load of analytics, got a whole load of customer details which it should not have got, which it then used to leverage to send out information to try and push people in a certain direction towards Trump. Any other questions from the audience? Please, Prashanto. Hi, uh, I'm Prashanto. So I was just wondering from the national cybersecurity perspective for both nations, uh, how do you view encrypted platforms? And that is, I, I know it is a long uh, standing issue uh, with uh, the nature of information that is demanded of, uh, say, a WhatsApp, etc., or the expectation that messages will be traced which goes contrary to, I mean, that's an existential question for them because it goes contrary to their fundamental product proposition. So how do you expect to deal with that? And that addresses the, the fake news issue also because you simply cannot trace fake news on an encrypted platform. The whole idea, it is encrypted. So, you know, boy, do you have any views on that? James, would you like uh, to take that one? And perhaps uh, Dr. Bell too? Would I like to take it? Uh, it's uh, slightly outside our room. It is a challenge. We we have law enforcement responsibilities ourselves as well. We work through MLATs. We have powers recently given to us by the UK Parliament on the back of our investigation of Cambridge Analytica, which uh, strengthened our powers to be able to compel organizations to produce information to us uh, in the course of our investigations. And more importantly, from our perspective as a data protection authority, to examine their algorithms and their systems in situ operating data so that we can understand whether there's bias or influence and how those algorithms work. They are probably more important than some of the broader powers we come across in the data protection sphere. Sanjay? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say quickly, from my dealing, I believe from my dealings with GCHQ, their view is encryption is a good thing. There are problems with it, but on the whole, encryption is a good thing for the majority of the, the population benefit from it being there. If you try and put back doors in it, and there will always be parts of the government which believe, for very good reasons, that this is a sensible thing to do, that will weaken it. So I think, um, I think the UK's bias is towards privacy over security on that particular one. Yeah, so I think uh, you got some answers from James as well as from Mark. Uh, I think there are challenges, but as this keeps evolving, you just, uh, I'm sure you, you're tracking what Australia has just done. So, so you're seeing as this technology keeps evolving, there are going to be challenges for law enforcement uh, from a national security perspective, and those have to be balanced. I mean, you have to take the uh, right approach to make sure that the balance is there, is whether it's privacy, whether it's security, and uh, we are also waiting for the privacy uh, bill to be introduced and be applicable, and then I think things will be a little more clearer at that time. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I have one question. Can I'm you quickly introduce yourself? And yeah, my name is Aman Javla. I'm, we people are from DOT, actually, Department of Telecom, Government of India. So we'll, we would like to ask, uh, like, uh, in the National Digital Communication Policy that has been recently released by the DOT, it mentioned uh, of uh, in concluding a national team of uh, CSERT, Cyber Security Incident Response Team. So how the Ministry of Information Technology and Ministry of Communication, are they thinking of some kind of collaboration? Are they working on some kind of collaboration to, uh, um, I mean, on on basis of this CSERT that has been mentioned in the NDCP policy? If your question is, is there a framework for CSERTs? Yes, there is a framework for CSERTs. No, sir. My question is not, uh, is there any framework for CSERT? I'm asking, is there any collaboration that the MIT is doing with Ministry of Communication? They uh, or I think Mr. Mittal uh, sitting here is, will be the right person. He is <laughs> collaborating uh, with my team, definitely. Well, uh, we have a plan for uh, bringing the telecom sectoral cert. So the plans are in place, and shortly you will see it. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any, any more questions? One last question. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your uh, time and patience. Uh, and thank you, panelists, uh, for taking out time for this particular event.